this poetry is not a luxury, and I had sent out um, Audre Lorde's essay, I thought I just wanted to read a couple little excerpts of it to kind of get us started because she, this is, she's famous for her poems, but she's equally famous for what she said about poetry, which is often just so insightful and crisp and brilliant. So this is just a few excerpts from her piece, Poetry is Not a Luxury. The quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. It is within this light that we form those ideas by which we pursue our magic and make it realized. This is poetry as illumination, for it is through poetry that we give name to those ideas which are, until the poem, nameless and formless, about to be birthed but already felt. That distillation of experience from which true poetry springs births thought as dreams births concept, as feeling births ideas, as knowledge births understanding. As we learn to bear the intimacy of scrutiny and to flourish within it, as we learn to use the products of that scrutiny for power within our living, those fears which rule our lives and form our silences begin to lose their control over us. Poetry is the way we help give names to the nameless so it can be thought. Mm -hmm. The farthest external horizons of our hopes and fears are cobbled by our poems, carved from the rock experiences of our daily lives. As they become known and accepted to ourselves, our feelings, and the honest exploration of them become sanctuaries and fortresses and spawning grounds for the most radical and daring of ideas the house of difference so necessary to change and the conceptualization of any meaningful action. Right now, I could name at least 10 ideas I would have once found intolerable or incomprehensible and frightening, except as they came after dreams and poems. This is not idle fantasy, but the true meaning of it feels right to me. We can train ourselves to respect our feelings and to discipline and transpose them into a language that matches those feelings so they can be shared. And where that language does not yet exist, it is our poetry which helps to fashion it. Poetry is not only dream or vision, it is the skeleton architecture of our lives. And so all of us are reading here as part of the International 100,000 Poets for Change Day the largest collective poetry reading on the planet, and reading, really thinking about the way that poems change us and change the world, and that giving birth to language does make things happen and change in the world. And we are, since we're on tape, mainly the Drew MFA poetry program with, I hope, some guests coming in. So, who wants to read first? Linda? Would you just introduce yourself, Linda, since we're going to hopefully be able to edit this sometime for our website? <laughs> right. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hey. Hey. Uh, I'm Linda Boldanzi, and I am in the MFA program. And um, I'm going to read for 10 minutes, I'm told, <laughs> if I last that long. <laughs> Uh, my first poem, uh, I have to tell you this before I read it. Uh, Little Boy was the code name for the atomic bomb we dropped on Hiroshima. Fat Boy, the code name for the bomb we dropped on Nagasaki. 1945. A civilization in history that slaughtered 240,000 people in a few minutes. Little boy and fat boy did it for them. Slightly bending at the waist, palms touching chin high, they took a bow for making the world a safer place. Two cities in rubble. Maybe the civilians were told to evacuate. Surely they were warned, weren't they? The swastika had already surrendered. Maybe the citizens thought a kinder, gentler people could never do such a thing. Is it possible the Air Force was told not to do any bombing in order to prevent the people from fleeing 
till little boy and fat boy got there? If told, most civilians would have been huddled with their families inside their homes, not having the new templates to understand what was coming their way. Thousands of radioactive bodies melting into the earth, screaming at the same time. Green, well-kept farms on hillsides that intensified the slaughter. Birds on fire flying across water to the emperor. Survivors slowly stitched the blossoms back together as if the sky hadn't fallen. Our leaders have saddled us with this. Anger, where is it? That poem speaks for itself, and so does this poem. Uh, it's about uh, our food and protecting our food. The title is Unloading Muck. White dust falls on the men as they load 100-pound bags of flour onto a truck. Tonight their wives will feel alive washing flour from their clothes. Leaving the Midwest in a rail car, the flower in the flower were vermin, birds, and insects, and their droppings. Insurance paid for the damaged flower. The NYSNE Railroad agreed to dispose of it per government regulation. The railroad tightly sealed the rail car, fumigated it, killing all vermin, birds, and insects, then sifted from the flower their droppings and the dead. How skillful failure is, how genuine, masquerading as your servant while it spends down your life. The railroad bagged the sifted flour and sold it. Now this to change uh, uh, tone, I guess you would say. Uh, this poem is about, in this world, how we have to get past our fears and our biases. It's at a slant, but I'm sure everyone here will get it. <clears throat> Pushing past. I'm here with a friend getting her third opinion, sitting in a large packed waiting room at Sloan Kettering. I sit next to a college girl, probably a freshman or a sophomore. She is telling me the history of her skin cancer, the worst kind. The prognosis and the sadness make it difficult for me to listen. I'm sorry for the girl. I'm afraid she might be contagious. I feel incredibly sorry for her. I decide not to change my seat. I even ask her questions. I sense she wants me to. Check the time. Uh, this poem uh, has to do with uh, getting along with our enemies and uh, those who we don't care for very much. Also soul uh, at a slam. Bread coffin. In a small stateroom with one porthole, a couple on their bunks each night watches brown lines of cockroaches crawling up the walls disappearing into the ceiling. The roaches do not linger. The ship is hardly moving, foghorn sounding continuously. Ships in the vicinity make the captain curt and sullen. The ship will no longer be debarking in New York City. The course has been reset for Canada. 
The couple on the deck peer into a vast whiteout, standing within fog, covering the middle Atlantic Ocean. Four, not visible from stern. Rome's holy underground returning to the couple's thoughts. Seated in the ship's dining room, pulling apart a hot dinner roll, inside it the man finds a dead cockroach appearing to lie in its coffin. The roach had made an error in judgment, so human. The man shows the red coffin to the lady. She takes a deep breath, wondering if the dead roach was one of their nocturnal visitors. He reaches for another roll, reaches for her left hand, kisses it. One more. This is also told at a slant. It's about um, how in our families we can't even get along. <laughs> or I guess maybe I'm speaking for my own family. <laughs> uh, certainly not yours, Mary, right? <laughs> and uh, it, we live in this world that's getting smaller and smaller, and the, the families of nations can't go along, get along, and you wonder why. The title is Invisible in the House. Stunted pines standing on the dunes, hoary from salt and white sand. My ancestors' ghost, biting off pieces from sleeves of crusty white bread. Gorgonzola cheese laced with tiny live white worms. These are the gifts remaining I had to give to my brother. I am the older sister remnant of a childhood game of put-down has become one-sided ridicule of me at holiday family tables. I will no longer attend them. At the dining room table, I have seen family members grow smaller and smaller over the years. Walking on wet sand at the ocean's edge, I find peace in the silence of the beach and the life-giving tonic of salt air. Once mouths were fed, diapers changed, TV washed, <clears throat> as it is in our world. Now they try to be what they think the people they are trying to impress want them to be. Seagulls call off key to the ancestors on the dunes. Contrasted against the white sand-blasted pines are scattered light pink sea roses with an overabundance of sharp needle-like thorns, more painful than the common rose. Chairs at holiday ta dinner tables with perfectly ironed white linens, sparkling crystal, heirloom silverware are disappearing. The rule of life. It is a new morning for me, seeing the present as it is, separated from the past. A new strangeness. In the mirror, I no longer see family. It's I. Seagulls drop clams on the jetty's large black rocks to open them. With my right hand, I dig up a tiny sand crab that tickles my palms, place it on the wet sand, Instantly, it burrows back under. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's go in the poetry chair next. Come on, Mary. I'm Mary Brancaccio, and um, the first poem that I want to read is actually from a set of poems that I'm working on that have to do with um, the Buffalo diaspora. And the reason I call it that is between 1950 and 2010, 
uh, the U.S. Census um, showed that Buffalo lost half of its population because of the decline of manufacturing jobs. And uh, as a result of that, a lot of the neighborhoods and especially many of the ethnic neighborhoods disappeared during that period of time. Um, this is a, a, a poem that's actually based on a story that when I was a kid used to be told to me by my cousins. And we always thought that it was a story that was just meant to scare us and keep us away from this wooded area that was very near Buffalo, the tributary of Buffalo Creek that ran through this neighborhood. It was a Polish neighborhood called Kaisertown. When I was an adult and started working on this poem, I talked to my cousin again about it, and he said, no, no, it's actually a, it's actually a true story. And uh, so it's called Margin of Error. And I think when I was thinking about this, I had in mind that, that quote from Stalin, uh, one man's death is tragic, and a million is a statistic. But then I started thinking also about this idea of statistics and how uh, we often lose the personal when we start thinking about the numbers. It's called Margin of Error. No one looked for him when he disappeared, climbing high in the leafy sycamore. No one watched as he tossed the plastic braid over a branch, nodding it one, two, three. Did he have a second thought? No one knows. Bad debt, infidelity, grief, no one knows. It was found that November when the tree canopy that hid his desiccated body fell in single leaves to the ground, proving that ones, when piled high together, really add up, exposing great losses. Another soul, more or less, won't tip statistical scales, hiding in margins of error, hardly noticeable to the man who records the numbers, the hangman's nine, the scaffold's seven. Little numbers will do to speak his pain, the paid in full of this man's death. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the idea of abandoned towns is, is something that uh, is coming back to me again and again. And, and I think part of it is having lived in California and visited a lot of ghost towns in uh, uh, in California, a lot of the gold rush towns that disappeared. But also, I think if you go through Ohio, Pennsylvania, parts of upstate New York, you will find these same uh, towns of, uh, disappearing before our very eyes. And this was a, a poem called Abandoned Town. It took them months to leave, months of pretending, months of slow swaps, pawning all they couldn't carry or wear. In the end, they even left their slippers by the door, as if planning to return after the working day and slip them on again. Little was left behind, a meager mattress, a dirty blanket, the old iron bed, its springs sagging under the weight of their absence. The town's end came in time, a few remained some years to keep a garden, tend a dog too old to travel. Some drank a shot at the table, then left, leaving the door ajar. Others lingered, waiting for reprieves. They visited a grave, walked a field, tore stems of long grass, chewing the sweet, slowly forgetting each and every face. After riding the rills across the plain where once a town of hundreds lived, we shuffle our dusty feet in rubble, glass shards, rusted nails. No wood, unwritten laws deed everything abandoned to those who stay. I am supposed to tell them of happiness in the new place, how life turned out for the better. At least some survived, at least there were children but I am muted by the weight of their sorrow. Mm -hmm. um, the next piece uh, is uh, connected to an event that happened in London in February 1996. There was a, a bus that uh, was familiar to me, that I, used to be the bus that I took daily when I lived in, in London. 
And uh, just after midnight on February 18th, the bus exploded. Um, there was a man, they believe, uh, carrying the bomb to another location um, at the time. And it was probably linked to the IRA bombing campaign that was uh, ongoing. Bomb blast on the 176, London, England. Headline, a man ferrying deadly cargo dies after a premature detonation. One of three dead. Eight others are injured. Shock waves peel the metal casing of the bus, spreading debris across deserted streets. Two night workers nearby suffer punctured eardrums. The driver's injured but he'll survive. Did he carry his precious load like an infant? I'm on the bus now, my daughter fussing in my arms, her brow creasing, corners of her mouth bending, and then her lips opening to a full-throated yowl. Did he sit as I did that afternoon, watching backs of heads, slowly unbuttoning coat with one hand, lifting shirt tail, loosening bands around my chest. I am lifting my baby to my nipple. She gurgles, then settles, latching on. Soothing electrical charges move through my jangled nerves. Did the driver's change box startle him? At the sound, my daughter lets go, turns her eye to the source. A drop of blue-white milk pooling in a corner of her mouth. What longing did he carry for his bundle? The black and white photo is too pixelated to make out much. Carcass of the bus, seats torn open, glass. There, I once sat there nursing my baby. The next poem I'm about to read was inspired by uh, some of the news that I continued to follow after the earthquake in uh, Japan in March. <clears throat> um, you probably know it was about a, I think it's the fifth largest earthquake ever recorded in modern times. And that's just because we don't know what the ancient earthquakes looked like, but it was a nine on the Richter scale. And about 90% of the people died because of the tsunami that swept over the coast of Japan. Um, I think there were 15,800 people who died, and there's still about 4,000 people that are still missing and have never been accounted mm -hmm. for. Um, months after the catastrophe, of course we know we're still living with the, the uh, problems, the fallout from the nuclear accident in Fukushima, uh, and we now know that there are people visiting who are survivors from Fukushima who are visiting the United States. And I believe they were re this week talking to members of Congress and also speaking to ordinary citizens at gatherings in New York. And um, they were talking about what happened in Fukushima. When the tsunami hit, it, it, the waves were about 20 to 30 feet tall, which is sort of hard to imagine. And it wiped out all these towns and, and so forth. But, what was interesting is that months afterwards, the, the effects of it are still being felt. And Japan reported a sharp rise in May in suicides, many of them linked to what happened. And one of the stories really caught my attention. And it was a story that one of the suicides was a man who had never been able to find his son who was lost in the tsunami. And I found myself thinking about that story and kind of haunted by this voice. And I wrote this poem called A Father's Lament. Many nights I held you, child in arms, two of us mesmerized by sea. Where's the light, I'd ask. You'd point to moon's reflection on rippled water. I long to remember that face, that little boy I loved, as I walked through jetsam on this beach, jumbled and twisted wreckage, sea swollen. A slippery slope of seal basks amid receding seas. Shaman moving between ocean and land. Its gray way knows futility as drawing lines for what is land 
what is sea. Sand softens and swirls, lumbering land lurches and spills. Then a black wave breaches the shore, pulling into its maw man, beast, boat, buildings. My son, forgive me. I have come to hate this sea of ours and its watery harvest. This dawn, thousands danced rigid and mute in morning's tide. You weren't with them. I have turned many soldiers, I have turned many shoulders searching for you. Again and again blank eyes meet mine. I should honor you, light a temple lamp. For others, chanting prayers bring solace. I find no comfort in this empty world. Frozen into fists are my fingers, flooded with keening is my soul. Unwilling and unable to end my search, my drum of sorrow thunders on. Okay. Um, the last one I don't think needs any explanation. It's called Street Patrol with Mortar Shell. He looks at the men, but tries to avoid their faces. He cannot bear their scared looks, how tension holds the jaw and eyelid, those slackened masks hiding their emotions. He knows how fast death descends, a bird of prey falling on a pigeon flock a claw catching flesh just as their wings lift off from gravel. He is haunted by death. That woman in the black caftan shuffling her grocery basket past market stalls of dried meats, open burlap bags of paprika, cayenne, turmeric. A flowered scarf tied snugly under chin. Her, hand, her child's wrist tightly grasped in her fist, her scolding words choked off by a sudden burst of sniper fire. Suddenly there's kickback as he fires his gun at a streak of light over a rooftop, a mortar shell. Blood, smoke, and debris thud down like crazy rains after a parching drought. Agonized shrieks from the wounded. A dying donkey brays, kicking its front legs slowly in the air, haunches torn open to bone. Nearby, an orange rolls down a muddy gutter. Thank you. different uh, edge to poetry is not a luxury. It's, it's very hard for me to write about things on a mass scale, like the tsunami and all of these different horrors. Um, because I, I think, kind of going off of what Mary was saying, that one man's death or even one man's life isn't, you know, that, that's really what's tragic. And so I, I tend to kind of hone in on the personal stories because, and even though in the grand scheme of things, lives have tiny horrors and small joys. Um, I think those are really uh, what matters. So um, these are all about just um, sort of different interpersonal relationships. And I'm actually going to end with a poem, not by me. Um, I know a few of us brought poems um, by other poets just to kind of um, keep that conversation uh, going with what we're reading. So, um, But on the subject of uh, poetry is not a luxury, I figured I'd start with a poem called Forgiveness. Riding blooms of white into acid rain, sting and sweat, silk and blister on my lips. To pretend nothing ever happened, would that be wrong or right, steal or flight to feel like I do, burn like I do, but if I don't, this is what I do. Make my bed with hornets and wonder why 
they never poison you. Um, this next one is actually uh, based on a prompt uh, I did with uh, Fletcher and D. Um, we all told a story, and the prompt was to interweave that story into one poem. Um, and I was amazed how none of us had problems with it. Uh, and it just reminded me of how details of stories can be different, but there's always an overarching theme or feeling that always connects us, that connects all of our stories. So um, this one's called Throwing the Easter House. <clears throat> Shelly remembers this night when she drinks, late April, me at the diner outside of town, her at home putting the Easter baskets together. She told me to call her before it got too late, but heavy breathing in a back seat get distracting. My phone vibrated for what must have been the nine billionth time before I picked up, her screaming on the other end. How could I be so reckless? A girl of 18, out with her boyfriend past 11? It doesn't look good, she said. I sat up, staring at fogged glass, boyfriend kissing my shoulder, wondering if this is how she felt after her first fuck at 16, or her first puff of weed a few months later and the rest of that year. I screamed all of this back to her, and all I got in response was not the sound of gingerbread and cellophane, but brittle plaster against flowered wallpaper and dial tone. When I walked through the front door, all I saw was plaster on tile, the phone swinging from its cord, her sleeping pill bottle empty. Stop punishing me for what you've done. Pop a chain link fence, destroy something beautiful. I shot a dusk lit melody with no flash. He sang my name under a cl mostly cloudless sky, backlit blue streaked with sorbet pink. Under his chin, knees bent, I snap. Perfect exposure, an LCD. Blown up, he was the perfect shade of flesh pink. But the sky was white, burnt out. <clears throat> but this isn't about that. This is about how the string of notes fell silent after the shutter release click. This is about how we didn't jump chain links in the same slick grass spot we came in. This is about a trail of muddy footprints leading to concrete. This slapdash harmony. <coughs> this poem actually, it's not titled yet. It's, these last two are still pretty rough. Sometimes I greet the day punching the sun. Some nights I pull the trigger. What happens in between is anyone's guess. The nights I don't remember my dreams, I count myself lucky. It's mostly the sting and hum of screams stuck in my throat, and how you've made your home in my bones, sucking marrow. You light a match, and my skin gets tight. Some nights, baby, I beg you to pull that trigger. Sometimes, I just burn alive. This one's called First Ride. I never noticed the sunflowers before, and it was as if I'd never seen a sunset, neon orb, the color of sherbet. I didn't know how wide I was smiling until my skin stung with wind song. After the sun sank below silhouette tree lines, after we had our fill of drinks and overpriced french fries, after I almost got into my first fist fight, we rode over a two-lane Pennsylvania bridge. The driver leaned forward, pointing out shadows on the water. And this last one, um, many of you know I'm a big Matthew Dickman fan. Um, <laughs> and this poem, uh, I, I, I just happened to come across it online, but it, it really ties, I think, all of you know, what, what we're doing here and what we're trying to say, really breaking the silence, either on, you know, talking about tsunamis and earthquakes or personal relationships and the tensions that are there. Um, and I'm sure you all will get what, what this is about, but um, it really ties together just writing about that one life, but it comments on so many other things. Um, so this last poem I'm going to read uh, is called Blue Sky. 
I wonder if it matters that I can't remember her name. Although we kissed on my front porch in early August, and by late August had taken off our clothes in her backyard. I wonder if the two of us knew somewhere in a fingernail, a freckle, that I would grow up afraid of needles and the color white, or that she would fall from a window before taking the exam on 1980 feminism she had been studying all semester long, in love with bell hooks and a boy she met in her Shakespeare class. I wonder if it matters that she might have jumped, that when I dream about her, I dream she's hanging in a closet. I wonder if it matters, even to the closet, that someone else was hanging there and that she slipped or stood up all of a sudden, as we like to say, and walked up to the window and then stepped out of the window. All of a sudden, but for the hours of sitting and the seconds of falling. I wonder if it matters that I loved her when I was 15, that her left breast had three freckles making a triangle of the nipple, or that she wrote a letter on my back with her finger so I could never read it, and have only guessed what she might have been saying to me. This blue sky, our blue sky, this green grass, our green grass, this trembling, ours. I wonder if I'm bad for not caring or for forgetting or for only loving myself so long it's become hard to imagine the letters of her name. And then I think the world is a crowded staircase full of midtown commuters, all pushing and pulling, each dropping something important that they will not remember until it's too late. And then I think I'm an idiot for thinking the world could be a story I tell myself to make myself feel better. And then I remember this thing. I am standing on the top of a building. A friend is opening a beer for me. He says my name. And all of a sudden, I'm wondering if it matters that I'm stepping up onto the flat head of a concrete gargoyle, looking down at the parking lot, stories below. And now my friend is yelling my name rapidly with a question mark after each time he says it. And I remember, blue sky, blue sky, green grass. mentor here at Drew, and um, this is one of my favorite poems of hers, and it's a poem that lives on in me for personal reasons and bigger reasons, and um, it just reminds me of how far we've come, about how far we've yet to go um, in our fight to eliminate hate and uh, find a cure, and this poem is inventory. Mm -hmm. One who lifted his arms with joy, first time across the finish line at the New York Marathon, six months later a skeleton, falling from threshold to threshold, shit streaming from his diaper. One who walked with a stick, wore a well-cut suit to the opera, to poetry readings, to mass, who wrote the best long poem of his life at Roosevelt Hospital and read it on television. One who went to 35 funerals in 12 months. Mm. One who said, I'm sick of all you AIDS widows. One who lost both her sisters. One who said, I'm not sure what he and I do is safe, but we're young and I don't think we'll get sick. One dying said, they came for me in their boat. They want me on it and I told them not tonight. I'm staying here with James. One who went to Mexico for Latrial, one who went to California for Compound Q, one who went to Germany for Venus Flytrap, one who went to France for humane treatment, one who chanted holding hands in a circle, one who ate vegetables, who looked in a mirror and said, I forgive you, one who refused to see his mother, one who refused to speak to his brother, one who refused to let a priest enter his room, one who did the best paintings of his life 
and went home from his opening in a taxi with 20 kinds of flowers. One who moved to San Francisco and lived two more years. One who married his lover and died the next day. One who said, I'm entirely filled with anger. And one who said, I don't have AIDS, I have something else. One with night sweats, nausea, fever, who worked as a nurse. One who kept studying to be a priest. One who kept on photographing famous women. One who kept on writing vicious reviews. One who kept going to AA meetings till he couldn't walk. One whose son came just once to the hospital. One whose mother said, this is God's judgment. One whose father held him when he was frightened. One whose minister said, Beth and her lover of 12 years were devoted as Ruth and Naomi. One whose clothes were thrown in the street, beautiful shirts and ties a neighbor picked from the garbage and handed out at a party. One who said, this room is a fucking prison. One who said, they're nice to me here. One who cut my hair and said, my legs bother me. One who couldn't stand, who said, I like those earrings. One with a tube in his chest who asked, what are you eating? How's your writing? Are you moving to the mountains? Who said, I hope you get rich. One who said, death is transition. One who was doing new work, entirely filled with anger. One who wanted to live till his birthday, and did. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just going to read three of my own uh, short poems. This first one is um, a metaphor poem straight that I um, that I wrote um, in an attempt to think about resiliency and how do we do peacefully that which we must do over and over again. And it's called Olive Ridley. Some unpredictable act calls this Olive Ridley back to the sands of her conception. She paddles ashore to do her work among the ancient aggregate. Swollen, she swims toward the Arivada, ensuring the odds for a few of the hundreds she will deposit in her nest. At nightfall, she digs with the weight of what she carries, tossing aside grains until she has created the warm teardrop essential for incubation. This Olive Ridley forgives her trespassers and drags herself back into the sea, trusting that some will crawl to the surface. And this poem is called Walk On. At the seven mile mark, we hula in 90 degree heat, singing, you've got a friend with the guys from Switch. Back on track, we cross over 287, and someone close by points out the hospital, anticipates air conditioning, flush toilets. That's the first place and last place I saw our mother, says my little brother, walking this route with me and my sister for our brother, positive more than 12 years, and we walk for every person ever infected, ever affected, the ones we meet or can't meet, people counting T cells, viral loads, death forcing its way in, however it can. It was, it was nothing they said, the grinding engines, the trembling chandeliers. It was nothing to disturb lobster extravaganza on the first night of this bunship voyage. It was a 10-foot wooden rowboat, oarless and bearing a hole. It was 10 men, skin burnt, close to being swallowed by the sea, gazing down from the eight decks that separated us from them, as the deckhands took each one aboard, I saw ten men losing their grasp. The wet feet, dry feet policy meant they must be sent back to Cuba once we reach land. I saw ten men reaching for me.
And I'm just going to finish with a poem by Judith Bulmer. She was my uh, last mentor here at Drew. And um, I love this poem. It's a hard poem, but I read it over and over to give me courage to help me mm -hmm. act on my commitment to peace and equality and transformation. And this poem is called The Sound of the Slap. I've carried the scream all afternoon in O'Hare. Maybe I'm the only person carrying the sound from the ladies' room where I found her, bracing herself against the cold tile wall, hiding from her mother, her mother's insistent calling her for medicine and cleaning, calling her to the white sink. I walked in as the woman with well-dressed hair and well-fed body pulled her child by the hair slapped her full across the face, then shoved the medicine stopper into the twisted mouth while the child screamed and tried to move. Inside my stall, I could hear other women running water and tearing paper, then clicking out, avoiding the mirrors at the sink where the woman held on to her child, now cleaning, now stopping to slap the red nut meat of her face. The skin of my cheeks stains. I am just one person, but I have a mouth, mm -hmm. but I said nothing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maya Rook, and um, I haven't read poetry at a poetry reading in a few years, so. Uh, on Thursday, when I got the invitation to come to this event, I was sitting there reading and watching videos of Jamie Rodemeyer. Uh, I don't know, for those of you who haven't heard, this is a 14-year-old boy who committed suicide last weekend. He had been bullied for his sexuality, um, and then he took his own life. And so this poem is for Jamie. Jamie Rodemeyer, a reminder, a haunting child in our midst, who is gone because of perceptions of sexuality, gone because of perceptions of his desire, gone because of a rejection of difference. We must embrace that difference, be the difference, take back the difference. There are webs of meaning spun around us, but who does the spinning? Last Sunday, after 14 years, this child left a space in the world. That web held him tight with gossamer strands that seemed so real, that seemed so natural. This reality we've constructed may be of our own making, but the lives caught up in it are flesh, skin, bones, hearts beating, minds thinking, desiring, fearing. So what can we do? My mind rages, heart aches, cracks, crumbles, breaks indeed. What can we do to cultivate love, compassion in a world where words can kill? where the power of language is so strong it can carry fear and aggression deep into the minds of others. Trick them, fool them, make them think that they are more or less than. But these same words that carry hate and ignorance are our words too. They are our tools. Change, 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 that haunting word daunting in its insistence that what is now is not what will be. But a change isn't gonna come. Fuck the future, change must be now. In this moment, right here, within us, between us, eyes meet, hearts beat, blood through these present bodies. Jamie no longer lives, his present is only past, though memory lingers. Change will not come from making bullying a crime. This will not stop the fear that fuels it, only <clears throat> suppress it. We must address these fears around sex, around desire, that exist in us, in others, within and beyond our culture. We must emphasize what we can do together, not tell others what not to do. These fears manifested, cultivated, burst through a boy's life, but we must live unafraid of that fear, live our lives in a pursuit of knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and not give up that pursuit, but deepen it, share it. The children who bullied Jamie, <coughs> who pushed him to a brink in an already hostile world, they must now exist in symbolic prisons they've created of the words they forced upon him, with a mirror reflecting a life now disappeared. But may these prisons not be permanent. May they open their eyes to the world, to these webs they too are caught up in. May they see beyond the fear, the aggression, the ignorance, 
which constructed boundaries that divided. And may those boundaries, those imaginary walls, crumble beneath the weight of compassion, of embracing the unknown, instead of resisting it. May they succumb to that weight, and in one moment, a seed of change could blossom. Their lives can be, perhaps, what Jamie lost. And in his loss, in his negativity, that space he left behind, we can, we must fill with change, with love, with difference, now. Um, my name is Elia Podzedek, and I'm also a student here in the um, Poetry and Translation program. I'll just grab my papers. Um, the piece I bought, brought by a poet other than myself um, are some excerpts from um, a long poem by Audrey and Rich called North American Time. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read a, a couple sections of it. Because I, Audrey, and, <coughs> Audrey and Rich and Audre Lorde are so intertwined in my thinking about poetry. They were kind of my first mentors when I was trying to find my voice as a young adult woman in the mid-1980s now. <laughs> North American Time. Everything we write will be used against us or against those we love. These are the terms, take them or leave them. Poetry never stood a chance of standing outside of history. One line typed 20 years ago can be blazed on a wall and spray paint, glorify art as detachment or torture of those we did not love but also did not want to kill. We move, but our words stand, become responsible, and this is verbal privilege. Try sitting at a typewriter on a calm summer evening at a table by a window in the country. Try pretending your time does not exist, that you are simply you, that the imagination simply strays like a great moth, unintentional. Try telling yourself you are not accountable to the life of your tribe, the breath of your planet. It doesn't matter what you think. Words are found responsible. All you can do is choose them or choose to remain silent. Or you never had a choice. Which is why the words that do stand are responsible. And this is verbal privilege. Suppose you want to write of a woman braiding another woman's hair, straight down or with beads and shells and three stand plates or cornrows. You had better know the thickness, the length, the pattern, why she decides to braid her hair, how it is done to her, what country it happens in, what else happens in that country. You have to know these things. I'm thinking this in a country where words are stolen out of mouths, as bread is stolen out of mouths, where poets don't go to jail for being poets, but for being dark-skinned, female, poor, I am writing this at a time when anything we write can be used against those we love, where the context is never given, though we try to explain over and over. For, th for the sake of poetry, at least, I need to know these things. Mm -hmm. One of the things I try to write about as a poet is um, violence against women and children, and I, and I really think of Audre's constant teaching that um, our silence does not protect us. Mm -hmm. And so we live in a country where, according to the FBI, between two and four of, between two and four out of five girls and two to three out of five boys experience some kind of sexual violence um, up into adulthood. So clearly, it's not that this doesn't happen, and it's not that we don't know about it. Between the kids it happens to and the adults who do it, that's the vast majority of us. Mm -hmm. but, but we have so little language for talking about it. and I struggle to find language that doesn't sound like just fury pouring out, but might actually have the transformative power of poetry in it. It's hard to find that language. So I'm going to read a couple of pieces I was working on this spring. Um, if you were following of the many horrific things that happened this year, um, in April on Long Island, the New York police actually started looking for the bodies of people who had worked as prostitutes had been murdered. They'd been there all along, they just hadn't been looking. And they started finding dozens of them um, along mm -hmm. Long Beach Island. So these first two poems are actually found poems. They are word for word from the New York Times, distilled down. 
um, except for a couple of little comments I couldn't help but put in, and I'll call those up, and they're marked differently on the page. Um, but this is what the New York Times had to tell us about this. Long Island Barrier Beach, Monday, April 5th. Remains of three more people bringing number to eight, op-ed, not people, but missing prostitutes. Grim December, bodies of four female prostitutes, a fifth last Tuesday. Authorities would not speculate about the identities, four in their 20s advertised on Craigslist. Eyewitness, phone record, budget hotel. Police began last year the search. Shannon Gilbert, 24, prostitute, went missing last May. None of the bodies were hers. Melody Engelbert, 34, driving from work, saw investigators unloading big cardboard boxes, said, oh boy, it's super shocking. Brendan Byrne, 36, who lives near, texted, they're in our backyard, literally. And this is from our article later that week. Megan Waterman, 22, Melissa Barthelme, 24, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25, and Amber Lynn Costello, 27. Vanished, drew little or no notice. Prospect of a serial killer. Four more bodies. That changed. Shannon Gilbert, 24, I should have said this another foul poem. Shannon Gilbert, 24, a prostitute but much more. Aspiring actress, oldest daughter, Mari Gilbert. Mari Gilbert said police failed to take her seriously until Long Island's latest serial killer case. Look at them. Throw away. Margins, anonymous, addiction, invisible, vulnerable, prey. Op-ed. Average age girls into prostitution, 13. Estrangement from their families. Op-ed. 57% of prostitutes report sexual abuse as children by an average of three perpetrators. Few notice. Joel Rifkin, unemployed landscaper, 17 prostitutes. Robert Shulman, a former poster worker, five prostitutes. Kendall Francois, eight prostitutes. Gary Ridgway, 48 prostitutes. I picked prostitutes because I could kill as many of them as I wanted. Evidence, brush and grassy dunes, bodies of dozens, perhaps hundreds of murdered prostitutes, women, men, and transgender people message. They should be very careful with their contacts. Mm -hmm. And then this, after a long time from that, is a sonnet that came out of that. None of us deserve this. None of us deserve this, but still, we'd been tried, judged, pronounced guilty. We believed that sexy was a path to power, that all those slasher movie but bloodbaths could mean nothing. We believed that our lives could be more than what it had taken to survive to now, to posting an ad for sexual services for sale on Craigslist. Undeserved, how our lives were as invisible as our corpses left to rot in brush. <clears throat> they have her torso but my left arm and don't know it yet. My skull, current carried, now rests between Natalie's legs and Lacey's head a great barrier reef of the disposable dead. And then these are three short poems um, by the poet that I'm translating, who's an Israeli writer named Shez. Um, and this was her book that came out in the late 90s. And she is one of the first people in, in Israel's a very young country. Um, it was a very old language in a very young country. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first writers to ever actually start talking about being an incest survivor. And these are my translations. And all of these are untitled. One. Take me by force. Don't. Require consent. Don't. Question how this came to me. Prevent me from knowing how this came to me. Second poem. Give me a tongue hot and yearning sliding slowly into me. Grab me from behind. Surely you know how I like it. Come, let's talk dirty. But you, a gentle little peach like you, wants love songs. 
and in me they've all been destroyed. My love for you is deeply animal. I love to swim in you like a newborn minnow who does not remember her past, who has lacked words and years, and who has never, not even once, sat ticking letters on a typewriter or drinking whiskey or screaming like a hellish beast as the ribbon of writing emerges from the room. And I want to close. Okay, I'm going to find it here with a different piece. I spent. I've spent the last 12 years as a Jewish um, non-Zionist peace activist around issues of justice in Palestine and Israel. And it's really hard to write about that because it's really complicated. And finally I realized it wasn't complicated, that I could just write the words and the words tell a huge story in that part of the world. So this is just that. It's called, with so much complexity, nothing was inevitable. And it's an epigraph by Adrian Rich's poem, Yom Kippur, 1984. Howling our loneliness within the tribes. And this is for Palestinian statehood this week. Arab, Jew, Christian, Muslim, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, fertile crescent. Arab, Muslim, Arab, Christian, Arab, Jew, Jewish, Arab, Christian, Arab, Muslim, Arab, Arab, Jew, Jewish, Jew, Christian, Jew. Arab Christian, white Christian, black Christian, Coptic Christian, Nasrani Christian, Arab Christian, Nile, Jordan, Tigris, Euphrates, four veins of the heart of the world. Christian Arab, Druze Arab, black Arab, Berber Arab, Israeli Arab, Sudanese Arab, Ethiopian Jew, Sephardic Jew, Mizrahi Jew, Ashkenazi Jew, Soviet Jew, Israeli Jew, white Muslim, Black Muslim, Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim, Druze Muslim, tribes older than tribal memory, Christian invaders, Arab invaders, Muslim invaders, Jewish invaders, Muslim convert, Jewish convert, Arab convert, Christian convert, strangers who rode the wind, strangers who rode the wind to sink roots into rock, Jerusalemite, Armenian. Christian, Jewish, Muslim, four chambers of this city's heart. Arab, Christian, Jew, Palestinian, Israeli, Israeli Jew, Israeli Christian, Israeli Muslim, Israeli Arab, Israeli Druze, Israeli Berber, Israeli Palestinian, Jewish Palestinian, Jewish Arab, Muslim Arab, Christian Arab, Palestinian Arab, Palestinian Christian, Palestinian Muslim, Palestinian Israeli. Israeli Palestinian, a Palestinian Jew, an olive tree, a lemon tree, from the river to the sea. silence people and then when you start seeing these open attacks on teachers, my god, <laughs> teachers, you know, and policemen and uh, who while they can be guilty of police brutality there are a lot of policemen who do the best they can and uh, who aren't guilty of those things and they get tainted by those who fail at their job so those are, that's what these quotes are about. The, Poem by the other poet that I'm going to read is by Willie Perdomo. Uh, it's called 41 Bullets Off Broadway. It's about the Amadou Diallo shooting in 99. Um, okay. 
41 Bullets on Broadway by Willie Perdomo. It's not like you were looking at a vase filled with plastic white roses while pissing in your mother's bathroom and hope that today was not the day you bumped into four cops who happened to wake up with a bad case of contagious shooting. From the Bronx to El Barrio, we heard you all face first into the lobby of your equal opportunity. 41 bullets like silver push pins holding up a connect the dots picture of Africa. 41 bullets not giving you enough time to hit the floor with dignity and justice for all. 41 bullet shells trickling into a bubblegum stained mosaic where your body is mapped out. Before your mother kissed you goodbye, she forgot to tell you that American kids get massacred in gym class mm -hmm. and shot during Sunday sermon. They are mourned for a whole year while people like you go away quietly. Before you could show your ID and say, Officer, four regulation Glock clips went achoo and smoked you into spirit. And by the time a special street unit decided what was enough, another dream submitted an application for deferral. It was, la vida te da sorpresas, sorpresas te da la vida, ay Dios. That means life gives you surprises, surprised you are by life. And you probably thought I was singing from living la vida loca, but being you prince, be you pauper, the skin on your drum makes you the usual suspect around here. By the time you hit the floor, protest poets came to your rescue, legal eagles got on their cell phones and booked red eyes to New York, file folders were filled with dream team pitches for your mother, who was on TV looking suspicious at your defense, knowing that justice has been known to keep one eye open for the right price. By the time you hit the floor, the special unit forgot everything they learned at the academy. The mayor told them to take a few days off, and when they came back, he sent them to go beat up a million young black men while your blood seeped through the tile in the lobby of your equal opportunity. From the Bronx to El Barrio, there were enough shots to go around. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next two poems uh, were written just out of observation, and um, even though it, this isn't in the poem, what I notice is that I went back to school very late in my 30s, so I got to go to <coughs> class with a lot of young students, 18, 19, 20, 23, and what I always got just from reading politically active stuff and then was kind of this feeling of what can I do? Mm. What can I really do? Nothing's going to change. Mm. Um, there's kind of this, this, this helplessness, helplessness. So I tried to write things that would speak to people who are younger than I am to let them know that there's something. That there's mm. always something. It's just a matter of finding. You, know? you didn't know what kind of cell phone you wanted to buy until you looked around. So <laughs> <laughs> if you look around, you'll find something. I paid a visit to Flint, Michigan, and it was amazing what I saw. There was no traffic in the morning, uh, no rush hour ever. There were no people on the streets. There weren't even homeless people on the streets, which was crazy. Um, that's how bad it was. So this poem came. And it's called Everywhere USA, because it's happening in places outside of Michigan, too. Main Street's not the main artery anymore. Coke cans, beer bottles, hot dog wrappers are today's street traffic. So many for sale signs, so much space available. The homeless know panhandling's no good out here. The Wells Fargo building, a crust on the long ago eaten pie. Bars won't open till midnight, populace won't wait till midday, and either way, no jobs to rush to. No rush hour traffic to sit in. No coffee and bagel, no routine hold a hope to. Fine wine beer, open, 24 hours except Sunday. Main streets, not the main artery. Car washes, supermarkets, hospitals, struggling, and the funeral home is jumping. Siding power washed, Cadillac hearse armor off. Poverty doesn't hasten death, but people die all the same. Main streets, not the main. Plenty of parking. Plant shut down left over widget parts all over. In the faded billboards advertised with us. In the haunted customer service window of the post office. In the deep, haggard faces of those on the brink and the ghost of this somewhere. Whatever lives, lives out of habit until it can't. Mm -hmm. 
This poem came from the democratization of Egypt when they had their uh, demonstrations and how we were all so captivated by what was going on there, yet here there are protests in almost every state that get no coverage by the media. Um, this is called Egypt, this is Wisconsin, this is New York, this is New Jersey. <laughs> Tariq in Cairo is Miguel in Brooklyn. Ahura in Mansura is Rachel in Columbus. Salim in Suez is Lamont in Madison. Na in Beni Suez is Beverly in Trenton. Tahrir Square is Times Square. Is Wisconsin State Capitol is Ohio State House. Army Barak is Jim Boehner. Army Barak is Scott Walker. Our Mubarak is Chris Christie. Our Mubarak is Shannon Jones. Secret police in America is accidental shooting us. Government corruption is Wall Street, Federal Reserve Bank, G8, Goldman Sachs, WTO, Bela, 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 Bela. Terror is a quiet present in a suddenly white house. Regime is elected officials ignoring constituents, media ignoring protesters. America is no democracy. It's a republic with democratic leanings. No democracy. Our Mubarak is CNN. Our Mubarak is Fox News. Our Mubarak is Rush Limbaugh. Our Mubarak is the Tea Party. Revolution isn't Glenn Beck. Suffering is not life without cable TV or math homework. Change is not a campaign slogan cannibalized by political copycats. Dissent is dangerous. Dissent is bloody. Dissent is violent. Dissent is absent. Thank you. I didn't write anything. I was just going to read someone else. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Perfect. I think. <laughs> I couldn't really think of anything of my own that would say what I wanted to say today. Roberto, you kind of started late with this, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm also a student in the MFA poetry program. This uh, poem is uh, by Tom Wayman from a volume called Poetry East, Native American Poetry. Solidarity. We go out to do it, believing if everybody did a little, nobody would have to do very much. After a while, we notice hardly anyone doing it. Then the behavioral psychologists hasten forward to point out that because we do it, no one else does. Does this mean if we did less, others would do more? Or that if nobody did it, everybody would do it? Since we lack proof, the latter is true. However, we go out and do it. Mm -hmm. Come on. No, turn it away. <laughs> So if this is poetry is not a luxury, uh, I started a poetry club at my school. It's a very small school, and it's a small school for uh, troubled or traumatized children, for the most part. Uh, and I was discussing how we would run a workshop and how we would put these things on an online forum, and 
how we go about actually getting to the heart of what we're writing and why we're writing about it. And the kids sat around and we discussed a, a poem actually by Jesse, uh, one of the ones that she had written, and I used that as how we're going to do this. And when I was done explaining, I was waiting for someone to say something and no one said anything. And one of the kids leaned forward and says, holy shit, poetry is scary. So we'll see how that goes. But I got three poems I'd like to read. Um, one of them is based off the prompt that Michelle did. Uh, it's her, myself, and Dee. We all told a story, and this is my take. And I call it, uh, I Was All of My Friends. Late summer, in a cabin, I called the cops on my mother after an argument at the diner over curfew and porcelain houses. Or maybe I'm mixing up a few stories. For the sake of this, there one time, I was a girl at Easter, or before, or nowhere near my grade school memory, and my mother screamed through the meds about dying. Mm. I called the cops when I graduated. I was 23, a girl again, still, with black hair, a soon-to-be ex, and a phone in shaky grip to an officer I called dad. Mom was kissing razor pills to guilt me. Mm. I stopped taking the guilt. April 2004, at a diner before 11 p.m. Just because you were a screw-up doesn't mean I am. I haven't been arrested, done drugs, been drunk, falling through Grandma's window at four. I came when called. I watched when both of us were helpless, Mom. I took the abuse with tears curling to the back of my chin, around my earlobe, Salt wincing far from handprint heat as it could. I took it, grinding molars that needed something to bite, so they broke themselves. I took it, laid bare and alone for hours in another's arms, bawling for all I'd done to hurt you. Mm. That might have been a little hyperbolic, a uh, combination of three different people's stories. But uh, it was brought up, uh, you know, a lot of these tragedies and a lot of these things, and people don't say anything. And it really starts at home. It starts with the family. Mm -hmm. It starts with talking about things. And my brother's never been to one of these, actually. <laughs> no one in my family's ever been to one of these before. <laughs> uh, and in our family, we're a little quiet about our sister. Uh, quiet because we're just so tired talking and not having her hear us. Mm. And this one's called, and it's kind of a running title, He Beats the Dog. He beats the dog. He beats the fucking dog. You wear his ring and he beats your dog. And you tell me he doesn't understand it's wrong. And he doesn't like your hobbies. And he never graduated high school. And he doesn't have a job. And he doesn't clean or cook or care for your pets or your property. And he doesn't respect our parents. And he beats the fucking dog. But he has a daughter. A daughter born when you started dating. A daughter you convinced him to see. You had to convince him. And you want children. And you want me to like him. To go to your wedding. To be the big brother who was always there when you had a problem. But you're not hearing me. He beats the dog. And then the last one uh, actually might be fairly hard for me to get through. Uh, and Tanner. This one's fairly recent. Uh, this one's called 
my brother's mittens. My brother, you never liked being covered. My younger brother, you were always my comfort in breakups, in losses, in being lost. I could curl beneath a blanket and keep the world on the other side of brass hinges. But you weren't the world. You were better. You would lie on my bed uncovered, and my hand on your head would let us both sleep. When I left the house, they had you covered. Everything you needed, all the love left in the walls was yours to take with a spot of sun by the patio door and the rocking chair. Christmas, the tree cover, the needles falling on your back, the grass in the spring you would roll in. We left you some, and I held you in the bathroom like I had for 23 years, and I comforted a corpse, or you comforted me again before the dirt. God, I'm so sorry. I never wanted to do it. You always hated me. Tonight, the old hard work of love has given up. I can't unbutton promises or sing secrets into your left ear, tuned to the quivering plucked strings. No, please, I, I can't face the reflection of metal on your skin and in your eyes. Can't risk weaving new breath into war fog. The anger of the trees is rooted in the soil. Let me drink in your newly found river of sighs, your way with incantations. Let me see if I can't string this guitar and take down your effigy of moonlight from the cross, the dogwood in bloom printed on memory's see-through cloth. Someone's beating a prisoner. Someone's counting red leaves falling outside a clouded window in a secret country. Someone holds back a river, but the next rabbit jab makes him piss on the stone floor. The interrogator orders the man to dig his grave with a teaspoon. The one he loves, her name, died last night on his tongue. To revive it, to take his mind off the electric wire, he almost said, there's a parrot in a blue house that knows the password, a woman's name. Sure. I want to thank Elliot for uh, getting the ball rolling, and uh, I'm glad. I want to thank the people who found this place for us to Michelle. have have this. <laughs> yeah, I guess she just never could come. Too bad. Yeah, Kristen sent me a text saying she couldn't make because she couldn't get out of work. Oh, yeah. that's too bad. She was so looking forward to it. She worked so hard. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where does she work? In a brutal diner, apparently. <laughs> 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 <laughs>